Uh, let me just tell you, this week I've been in Kentucky in a school system and um, working with a school system that it has a lawsuit waiting to happen. And I've been kind of negotiating between parents and the school system and it all turned out like the stars aligned. And we got like the IEP, we got the, um, this kid, they, the school did a really ugly thing and so then the parents ripped the kid out and put him in home, but all the teachers came to the home and um, now we got an IEP, we got a three year eval done and we got her eligibility from mild mentally delayed to deaf blind. So we really, yeah, hammered it. So I'm a little exhausted, but I'm also like wired for sound. So um, anything will come today. Who, who knows what will come out? I can tell you right now, you have a handout. And in that handout, you may as well just, just turn it over and take notes because I've taken all pictures out. And I probably have scrambled things around since I had to send that in. Because you know how that works. You, you start thinking, oh, I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about this. And so, you know, if you're going at, looking at your handout and looking at me and going, oh, this is not matching, um, sorry. <laughs> okay, so a little bit of my background. My brother was hit by a car. When he was two, I was four. And that's my introduction to special ed. The budding teacher in me as he got out, he was unconscious for six weeks and then went, was in the hospital for a while. And then when he came home, he was a captive audience. And my little four-year-old self would go to preschool and kindergarten and all those things. And I'd come home and just tell him, you're going to learn this. You have to learn this. And, you know, he was in a wheelchair, so he couldn't leave. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was kind of, you know, bless his heart. He is, uh, he, he. But today he is 58. Um, my mother just passed a couple of months ago and he was her caretaker. So, you know, um, my parents raised him. They're, I'm one of five. My dad was a World War II vet, a sergeant. And uh, so he had five little soldiers <laughs> that he kept us in line. And my, my brother, the youngest, who um, had some real disabilities, physical more so. He had some traumatic brain injury, but he also had some real physical disabilities, has some. And, uh, but my parents treated him like they did the rest. He had you know, dishes to do. He had all the other things that all of us. Saturday was work day and he got to work just like the rest of us. He went to public school. He started just like everybody else. Um, how they did that, I don't know, because it was before special ed. And, and he just showed up, and I think the teachers kind of said, oh, well, okay. <laughs> and we just acted like, well, that's what you're supposed to do, right? So um, my parents never let that limit him. And I think that I brought that into teaching. So the budding teacher of me went to school, and I taught deaf and hard of hearing kids for 17 years, my last three years, I taught special ed by day and GVs by night. So I kind of burned myself out of teaching. I had nothing else to give. You know, I think with teaching, you have to learn as much as teach. It's that flow. Look at all of you going, amen. I love it when I get an amen section. <laughs> so you have to teach. In, in order to teach, you have to learn. And I found myself being able to do both of those jobs in my sleep, and it's not real healthy to do that in a jail, you know? So I quit. I spent a year sitting on the bench. Then I went to work for the National Center on Deaf Blindness. And I worked there for 15 years. And the website that we're going to do today um, is a result of my work there. Um, I was the lead on literacy. And with, along with my good friend, Barb Purvis, who some of you may know, she did some EI stuff in your state. So she and I helped develop this along with the, the nation and the Deaf Blind Projects. What we did was the first section of it, we did 
four of us kind of put it all together and then the next sections I'd been by that time I'd been out of the classroom for 10 years and you know it it didn't roll off the tongue like it used to so we then contracted with um, teachers to help us build the rest of the website and, and put resources in and stuff. So it's a true labor of love. And um, I'm, I'm still excited about it. I still love when I go out and people say, oh yeah, I love that website. I use it all the time. Because what it is, it was designed with you guys in mind. It was designed as I'm a teacher and just today I found out they're wheeling in a deaf blind child tomorrow and um, I don't know anything about this and I've got to teach literacy. I've got 15 minutes to figure this out. So that's how this was designed because it really is, I know that you don't have time to really pour into all the articles and all the this, that and the other. So I will talk about that website in a few more minutes uh, in more detail and I'll show it to you. But wanted to let you know where that came from. The last couple of years I've worked independently and I've done an array of things. I talk mostly on communication, which some of you look familiar. Were you here this fall, last fall? I thought so. I thought I'd, I recognize some of you. Yeah. yeah. And maybe you? No? Okay. You two, I know. <laughs> the rowdy crew. You, yeah, some of you I really recognize and, and welcome back. You're going to hear kind of the same stuff, but with a different spin. Just a, okay? Okay, so with that, let's get this party started. Now, what I'm going to do at first is hide this because, you know, I have been traveling and I can't find the one sheet of paper I need. So I'm going to shut that and go to my cheat sheet here. What I want you to do is get a piece of paper out. And it can be just a scrap. You're not going to need it for the rest of your life or anything. But what I want you to do is think about yesterday and today and jot down or tally the things you've read to gain information. Yesterday and today. What have you read to gain information? It may be the map to get here. Road signs. The agenda. That's all I'm giving you. <laughs> well, pick a day any day. It doesn't have to be. <laughs> It'll be all right. <laughs> no one's going to quiz you, I promise. All right, you ready? Next question. Think about this week so far at school. And it's Friday now, so you really, we're not gonna think about today because it's different, okay? But think about this week and list as many things as you can think of that you've written to help yourself get organized. Are you one of those that have post-it notes all over you? And don't they feel good when you can scratch them off? Oh, this crew back here, they're organized, I can tell. <laughs> okay. Next, think about the last class you took. <laughs> it can be for credit, it can be for professional development, and list the things you wrote or read during that class. I know, <laughs> it's been a minute. <laughs> You've slept. <laughs> mm -hmm. It is, think about the last class you took 
for credit or professional development, whatever, and list the things you wrote or read during that class. Where's my dissertation queen? <laughs> Ladies, I'm sharing this table with you. I'm just going to move in with you in a minute. Okay. Ready? In the last month or so, note one or more things you wrote to someone that made them feel special, proud, valued, welcomed, or appreciated. In the same time period, think about anybody make, making a note about something you've read that made you feel special, proud, valued, or appreciated. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think you're special. <laughs> See, you can tell me that. <laughs> All right. Are you ready? All right, the last question. Think about a leisure activity such as going to a movie, eating out, planning to take a vacation, Jot down some of the reading activities involved in that event. Jot down some of the writing activities involved in that event. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> think pre-baby. <laughs> I know it's foreign. <laughs> Are you good? Okay. So, we all know that reading and writing are critical to our lives. But let's think of some of the specific reasons. Think about the exercise you just did. And what are the values of reading and writing to you? Anybody want to take a shot at that? Necessary for, I mean, for life. It is necessary for life. Why not? Everything I do requires it. Yeah. Whether it's something for pleasure or for something for work. Exactly. Exactly. You're exactly right. Um, why are they so critical? Communication. To get information and some, what else? Communication. Communication. What else? To organize yourself. Organize yourself. Right. And why, um, okay, you, okay, if you think about being in a foreign country and think about not knowing the language and seeing those signs or trying to make your way around and you, you just feel so helpless, right? Now let's think about our kids. Let's think about our kids and how important literacy is to you, why wouldn't it be important to our kids? So that's today. I want you to just keep that in mind and think about how critical it is to you, to your kids, to your family, to others that you work with. And I want us then to think about our kids, okay? Because today I hope to show you how that's gonna work. I hope to show you a little bit of how we're gonna make that happen, all right? Okay, so I'm going to put this down. I'm done with that. And let the games begin. All right. So some of you were with me last fall and I talked a lot about communication and what that looks like. What this slide represents is how they're all so interrelated. They're all so actively together. Listening and speaking, reading and writing, 
all of that happens at the same time. And this is, this is how it develops. You can't separate out communication and literacy. They're one and the same, really, if you think of it in that way. You know, there's so many things that we learn before we ever come to school. Things that you've learned that you don't even, you're not even aware of. But I want us to think very much that communication and literacy all happen at the same time. Okay? And that's, that's what today's going to be all about. So, when we think about listening, it could be that instead of listening, we're watching for signs. Okay? So sign language is, is a deaf person's way of listening or speaking, right? Or using other senses to take in information. Um, I come from the deaf-blind world, so this is listening for a lot of my kids, where their hands are out and they're either feeling a tactile symbol or they're feeling my hands as I'm signing. So that's listening for some kids. Speaking could be using words, or signs, or some kind of augmentative communication system. Reading can be print, it can be braille, large type, and sometimes it's object cues. Sometimes that is, and we'll talk more about what that looks like too. And then writing can be handwriting, it can be braille, or some use of computer, typewriter, word processor, or some kind of um, assistive technology, okay? Hmm. So we're going to look at literacy with a new, different perspective, okay? We need to think about literacy in a whole different way. So let's talk about typical learning, because I think we have to stop there, start there, for us to figure out what that looks like. All right, so this is not on your thing. It's not in your handout, so don't panic. Um, if anybody wants this PowerPoint afterwards, I'm sure I can give it to Lisa and she can send it out to you. There are about a million pictures in it, and they really, you couldn't see them on your PowerPoint, and it's a waste of paper, so I'm not, you know, that's why you don't have all of the PowerPoints. So typical learning starts this way. We learn 90% of everything we're going to learn through incidental learning. And that is as you were born and starting to develop. You picked up so much information that nobody sat down and formally taught you. You just learned it by watching others, by someone telling you do this, but they didn't sit down and actually teach you things. 90% of everything happens just automatically without effort. Think about when you walked in this room today, you swept your eyes around and automatically you knew, oh, we're set up in small tables all around. I want the back table. That's why they came early. So we, and you, you saw that the chairs were set up this way. You, no one had to tell you what to do. Why? Because you've already done it before. You've had this kind of experience before. You didn't have to worry about it. Think about when you go into restaurants. You automatically, walking in the door, know whether or not the hostess is going to seat you. It's cafeteria style, or you go up to a counter and order. You know all of those things. No one tells you that. Why? Because you've had prior experience. And also, with your vision, you watch others. Oh, this is how we act. Okay? Then, there's secondary. And secondary is what I'm doing now. It's presenting. Somebody lecturing to you. See how little? And that's what you guys do every day for a living. That much is how much the kids learn. In the scheme of life. Then, very small little piece very tiny little piece do we do direct. Now, my early interventionist in this room, how many of you? I didn't even ask who I had. Okay, I've got early interventionist, uh, TVIs. Oh, wow, in the house. Um, deaf. Ooh. 
Parents. Speech. No speech? OT. No OTs. Uh, classroom, regular ed? Just special ed? Did I miss anybody? You all are special ed. Okay. What? Did I miss you? Oh, okay. Paras. Excellent. Excellent. So glad you came. Okay. So 90% of all we learn is incidental, right? But when we have sensory channels that are impaired in some way, they turn the world upside down, okay? And what happens is, with our learners with deaf blindness, 90% of everything they need needs to be hands-on. With very little do they get out of um, secondary or lecturing. And then hand, um, uh, incidental learning is almost non-existent. So you stop and think about everything you've learned just by watching and then think about what your students don't have. That's kind of an eye-opening thing to think about, but it is something that you really need to think because these kids require that hands-on, that concept development, that really thinking through things, okay? And hopefully, by the end of the today, I will have given you some strategies. So what you need to know, this says literacy is a functional skill. Because what do we hear from people? Oh, he's not ready. Oh, he needs to do this and this and this. And this, the little gal is looking at the little guy and she says, but if you don't learn to read and write, how are you ever going to learn how to text? And you know, texting is important. I have a now six-year-old granddaughter, and for the last two years, she's found her mother's cell phone. Her mother lets her text me. And I get this long list of emojis. Yeah. I will, you know, my phone will ding, and then here's this long, just all kinds of emojis. So we started it that way, where then I would, I would send some back to her. And then I'd, hi, Hannah. And now she's in kindergarten, and her, sight, her words that she's learning, she's typing them to me. She's texting them. So now I get emojis still, because, you know, hey. But I also get one, dog, got, the. <laughs> and so now we're starting to do that communication that is everybody else text in the world. So, all you grandmothers out there, hey, it's fun. Because th those emojis are powerful. And she's knowing that literacy is important. She learned that and learned how to do that. Okay? So, some barriers to literacy. I think the biggest one is attitudes. Oh, no, there's no way. Why are we even bothering? And, you know, he, he, he's not very bright. You know, we're just lucky if he'll eat and, and, you know, we just want to make him comfortable. And unfortunately, I've been all over this country and I've seen that quite a bit. Where people just discount kids that they just, they, and they become just these things that you move from place to place. <laughs> and don't think about that there is a kid in there. And they have things to offer us if we take the chance and we take the time to learn. Those low expectations. You know, I could sit here and before this day is through, I could, uh, I told you I'm gonna act on you, baby girl. <laughs> before this day is over, I could, oh, sweetie, you can't use that. Here, let me help you because, mm, bless your heart. Oh, here, let me just take this pen from you because you might stab yourself with it. And I could really, if I sat here all day and every time she started to do something for herself, I went over, oh no, let me do it. Then what would happen? By the end of the day, she's just going to put it out there and go, I know she's coming at me. Here I am. I can't get away from her because it's just rude. <laughs> but 
anyway, so low expectations. If we don't expect kids to do things, they're not going to do it. My bar is up here. Now, am I realistic? You betcha. You betcha I know. But if I don't put that bar up there and expect things from kids, I'm not going to get anything out of them. Limited opportunities. If they don't have the opportunities to practice these skills, they're not going to do them. It won't become rote to them like it does to you. Limited means of accessing literacy, and a lot of times that's the piece. It's not that we don't want to do it, it's we don't know how. We can't figure out. And so it's easier, you know, I've got eight, ten kids in my classroom, and most of them are at me like this, and then I've got this guy over here in a wheelchair. Well, he kind of gets left out only because i got to deal with all this. And he's not screaming over here going, hey, help me, help me, here I am. And so a lot of times, and it's well-intended people, I'm not bashing, please know that. I'm not judging because I know what it's like. I spent 17 years doing it. So it's not that I'm saying, oh, well, you should. It's, it's the fact of life. It's the reality. Then the limited time, that's the biggest piece. These kids require so many different things that we have to do manipulatives and we have to do all of those kind of, um, we have to make those accommodations and modifications. And just thinking through, I'm teaching this lesson and then I've got him. What am I going to do? How do I do this with him and, and I just don't have time, right? So I don't know how, and I don't have time. Then there's the age factor. Oh, you're 10. You know, you didn't show me from 5 to 10 that you could do anything, honey. So really, it's just too late. It's just too late. To that I say, mm -mm, no, that's not true. That's not true. It doesn't matter what age. Then the last one is those prerequisite skills. Oh, well, as soon as you learn cause and effect, then we'll start doing the other things. He can't do this, so oh well. We have to, and it's all excuses. It's not that they don't need those prerequisite skills. It's that you have to teach them intentionally. It goes back to that incidental learning. Okay, so some assumptions about literacy that I want us to just keep in mind because this is where I'm coming from today. All children can become and are becoming literate. It's a continuum, folks. It's a continuum. They're somewhere on that continuum. Now, they may be at the very start of that continuum, but they're there. They're on there. It's up to us to figure out where they are and start moving them along that continuum. So there's the first thing. Literacy development is founded on experiences and concepts, beginning with very early in life. It starts from birth. Literacy starts from birth. And think about experiences and we're going to talk about experiences and experience books. That's what I hope to take, give you to take home today. And then concepts, they really have to be developed. And we'll talk about that too. Literacy uh, instruction must include communication and socialization. So that socialization, it's so important to you guys. You came in today, and some of you know each other, so y'all have been just visiting and catching up. It's just wonderful that we have the day to do that, right? Why wouldn't it be the same way for our students? We got to think about it that way. And then there's that continuum from early emergent literacy all the way to independent literacy. Okay, so this is... Lit, um, literacy for learners with deaf blindness, each one of these show some kind of literacy instruction going on. 
In this one, there's, see the calendar system that's behind? That's his daily schedule. That's his calendar system. That, for this child, that is literacy for him. He's learning. It's going from left to right. That's a literacy skill, right? He's learning how to maneuver and touch those objects. And with those objects, that's giving him information. Much like if I were to hold a, a manual on how to change the oil in my car, right? So that's his literacy. It looks different from other kids' literacy, but it's still that. This child's looking, she's got a light box. And underneath that, they've put a magazine or a picture on there so that she can see. That's as much where they're having a conversation and they're talking about those things. N is for nose. So they've put her alphabet down there on a light box so that it can reflect in and show. And this one, she's looking at a book. She's in her side liar because a lot of kids have to be up in those standards, all those different things. I would caution you though, because sometimes, especially in a standard, it's all the kid can do to think about or try to keep their, their balance. And even though they're in there and tight, they still, that's a lot, and then you're coming at them, oh, now we're gonna do this, this, and this. Sometimes that's an overload, depending on the kid. So you need to think about that. But they're using the time instead of her just lying there. And a lot of kids with charge, they have vestibular problems. So have any of you ever had vertigo? Yeah, it's ugly, isn't it? Well, some of these guys are born without semicircular canals, but they're still walking. Nobody knows how. But that reeling in, and some of them have to get down in the floor. They put their legs, wrap them all around, all kinds of stuff, and then they get like this with the book. And what do we do as teachers? You need to be sitting up. Why aren't you sitting up? <laughs> but this kid can't keep their head straight unless they are on their back. They can't focus in on the book because it's like that vertigo thing going on. So we have to stop and think about, mm, what is this kid feeling? Could it be that? That's where the OTs, and I wish there were in, some in here today. OTs are your BFFs. PTs also. PTs also, absolutely. And you say, help me figure this kid out. Help me figure out how we can do these, you know, different things with them, but yet I still can do, teach literacy or go on and do my instruction. And this child, deaf, blind, and has the um, CCTV, right? Okay, so all of those are literacy. It just looks a little different. Okay, so this is the foundation of everything that this website is all about. What we did was we were charged by OSEP to um, do performance indicators, outcomes and performance indicators. So my director said to us, I need you to go through all material about literacy. I want you to look at all research, all everything else, and I want you to come up with performance indicators and outcomes for literacy. So we did, we come through all the uh, relevant um, research articles through blindness, deafness, deaf blindness, <laughs> severe and multiple disabilities, and typically developing kids. Because we needed that frame of reference. We needed to know how do typically developing kids develop literacy. So what does that mean for our population? And what we did was we decided that the best way to do that was to marry the stages of literacy development with the National Reading Panel's five components of literacy. So phonemic awareness and uh, phonics, vocabulary, comprehension, and I can't think of the fifth one, but it's there somewhere. Fluency, there it is. Woo. Way to retrieve, whoo. <laughs> okay, so we go through these stages of literacy, but at the foundation of it all 
are these components, which are building a trusting relationship. You got to start there. Communication, exposure to books and writing materials. If they haven't been exposed to it, how are they going to do it? Then concept development and then child interest. Because if I were to bring those manuals on how to change the oil in your car and hand them out to you and say, this is what we're going to go over today, most of you would find your way to the door or you'd be laying in the floor asleep. Right? So you have to stop and think about the child's interest. Okay, so when I'm going to go through those stages very briefly to give you a reference of what those different stages are. So in building a foundation, that's attending, this is for typically developing kids, okay? Because we have to start there. We have to stop and really unpack. What does that look like for all kids? And then from there, we're going to springboard off of that, okay? So with building a foundation, they attend to pictures, they pack pictures, hold and carry books, maybe point and name objects. Now you think about little babies. Think about how that, you know. And then turning pages with help sometimes. Mouthing books. Yes, we all did it. Bringing a book or asking to be read. Reading to self, especially if they've read a book a lot, then they may come up with how to read all of the things because it's been read to them so many times. Handling writing materials or scribbling. Searching for favorite pictures. Or notice or protest when an adult leaves out or gets a word wrong. So as you're telling that story over and over and you know how you're tired and you want to flip through about five pages and they catch you at it. Dang. Dang on it. Why'd you pay attention, kid? Okay, so that's the building of foundation. That's that early level. And that's typically in the first few months. Whoop. Okay. So in early emergent literacy, they're learning reading and writing are life activities. They're watching you. They're watching parents. They're watching siblings. And they're figuring out, you're doing this thing either here on your phone or here with a book or here as you're writing out your grocery list. They're seeing that and going, oh, well, that stuff is important to you, so it must be important to me. When we were developing this website, my granddaughter came to stay with me, and at that point, she was about nine months old. And her daddy very much is, my son-in-law is, is amazing. He started the very first day she was born reading to her. He took books to the hospital so he could read to her. And he read to her every single day. He also would get her up in the mornings and say, work gives you a sense of pride and accomplishment. <laughs> and he said he did that until she could start talking. And then he quit because he wanted to just plant that seed in her little brain. <laughs> so he's very much diligent about writing, reading and was at those early stages with her. She came to visit me when she was about nine months old and she stayed with me for a few days. And we were doing this website, we were developing this website. And she was in the floor and she had all these toys around her and a couple of books. And she stopped everything she was doing, crawled over to the book. And I was like, oh, oh, I need a video. So I took a video of her as she's looking at the book, she's pouncing it back and forth, she's flipping it over, she's trying to get it figured out, and she sat for probably two minutes doing that. Now all these other toys were around her, but she went for that book. Why? Because her parents had made sure that she knew that was important to her life. She mouthed it, all that good stuff, all the things that I talked about earlier. But that is as much an important part 
of literacy development as anything else. You have to go through that stage. Kids have to mouth books. They have to flip them to figure out what's front, what's back. All of those things are important to literacy development, and it's something every one of us have done. We don't think about those things as being important, but they are. They're vital. If you don't know which is the front of the book, how can you start it? Right? So you ha if you don't know how to turn that page, and that each page has to be turned. A lot of our kids, unfortunately, they have never had that opportunity. Uh, and a lot of it is nobody's fault. I'm not saying, oh, you haven't done your job. Not at all. And the parents haven't done their jobs. A lot of times our kids have been in the NICU and, it, and the parents are in survival mode. And they don't think about that because they're thinking about all the other things. They're just overwhelmed. We as educators, we don't stop to think about, oh, just them turning the page or knowing that that's an important part of it. We don't think about that. We discount it and they don't have the exposure to it. Then, if, or with early emergent, they show interest in books and print. They handle books. Become aware that books have stories. There's information in there. They listen to stories. They might recite phrases or stories. You know, those um, like one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish, whatever. All of those different things or um, pout, pout fish with the pout, pout face. And he does the, well, I can't remember what the, I can't remember that one. Oh, anyway. What? It's the pout, I'm the pout, pout fish with the pout, pout face and I spread the weary drearies all over the place. Glub, glub, glub. My grandkids love that. My husband reads it to them. And they just, they, they get so tickled. Even though they're older and that's, you know, a little kid book, they love it when he reads that to them. So those familiar words and phrases that are in books and they can't wait. Begin to prefer certain stories. You know, how many times can I read Pout Pout Fish? And then... Scribble or make letters like shapes or initiate cursive writing. So they're starting to look like, oh, you're doing that. They see mom writing her grocery list or dad doing whatever. And they find that that's really important. They see their teachers writing. All right, so in emergent literacy, text and pictures convey meaning. So they're starting to figure out that these really mean something. They make the connection between signed and spoken words and print. And then understanding picture books. Understanding that they have meaning. Am I in your way? Sometimes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Don't mind me. <laughs> Recognize and begin to read familiar environmental print. Think of your own kids and how early they saw those golden arches and knew that that meant McDonald's. Think about that. Think about how they see things and they recognize. And that's as much literacy as anything else. That's exposure. That's getting it. They're beginning to read some words, like their own name. They're recognizing those things. They may write some letters. In developing literacy, it's words are made of different sounds. You decode words, so you're starting to figure that out. Understand that short chapter books, informational material. I have a first grade grandson who's, we're reading chapter books. You know, oh, let me back up. That's important. And all kids about that age, they're so impressed with them. We're reading chapter books. Well, professor. Then beginning to cite vocabulary. They're, they're starting to recognize certain words and, and symbols. 
putting words together to form simple sentences. So that's where my granddaughter Hannah is. She's doing those words and texting me and doing those simple sentences now. Learning to develop ideas in a logical progression. And they write about topics of personal interest in various modes. So they may do letters. They may draw a picture that represents what they want to say to you. They could do stories, poems, notes. Then early independent literacy, they're beginning to read for interest or information. They're writing their own ideas. They're asking and answering questions about the text. They're writing answers to open-ended questions reading independently for extended periods of time, use detail and orientation, uh, organization in writing. So they're starting to formalize that writing a little bit more and expanding it. They may be putting more words into their simple sentences. They may have more descriptors in there. They might be recording observations and then producing writing and artwork to reflect the personal response to text. Then in independent literacy, there's decreased uh, support for new tasks or context. So they're starting to catch on and it doesn't take them that long. They can read for information and get the directions and move on from there. We're not having to do as much for them. Experiencing new feelings and attitudes through reading. So that's when they're getting into the novels and figuring out there's a world out there that's not like mine. And then reading for information or acquisition of knowledge. Their comprehension is increased and they can self-correct pretty quickly. As they're reading and they don't get it right, then they can, they, oh no, no, that's the way it's supposed to be. And then they're reading independently with confidence in multiple modes. So multiple venues and ways they're doing it. And they have organized and coherent written work. Then the last one is expanding literacy. And that's where they start the analysis and critical thinking about ideas found in text. They form their own opinion based on facts. So they've read something and then they decide whether it's true or not. Whether they want to, they agree with that opinion. So that's editorials, those kind of things. Blogs different things like that, where they can look at those, they form their opinions on facts, huh? if they can find the truth, and then invent point of view difficult from, different from those that re they read. They read widely and critically and frequently. And that's where most of us are. Well, I'd say all of us are. They re read for a variety of purposes in a variety of modes. And that really starts happening third, fourth, fifth grade and on up. This, this stage. Then write for a variety of reasons in a, in a lot of different modes. They write for fun, they write for information, they take notes, they do all of those things. Okay? All right, so from that We've talked about the stages of literacy development. Now I'm going to go to the website that we developed. This was, um, it's called All Children Can Read. And it's literacy for children with combined vision and hearing loss. Now, I will tell you that's who paid the bills for it. I will also tell you with this website, I do believe with all my heart that it goes be way beyond deaf blindness. So kids with autism, kids with uh, multiple disabilities, typically developing kids in some venues, um, LD, not so much but more of your profound, severe profound guys, this it has strategies that can help you. So thinking, it, it, broader thinking, okay? And I'm gonna go live to the website and I'm gonna give you a little tour of it. All right, so it starts off with, this is the home page, and it starts with the literacy skills checklist. Now, if you look in your folder on the left-hand side, I don't know my left from my right, so I have to, my left side, in there, 
you have, well, you've moved yours around, I think, all your information. There is what's called a literacy skills checklist. It's a couple of pages long. And that really was developed by Barb and I because we wanted you to have something to go by to where can I go, this is where this kid is. So you were asking about your, your student, I want you to be thinking about your student and think about this, this checklist. And now you can download this off of the website, so if you wanted to just go through that checklist and think about your student and do it now, you could do that. If you want, we can just move on and you can come back to that later. It's up to you. Does everybody have a kid in mind, or do you want to? Does it have to be deaf blind? No. I would go in more of a um, complex child, but they don't have to be deaf blind. Like I said, deaf blind dollars pay the bills. And even if I still worked at the National Center, I would say that to you because. You know, I really feel like you're out there and uh, you're drowning. <laughs> and so any kind of help you can get, hey, it's better. Okay, so in that checklist, it shouldn't take more than five minutes. Because all you're doing is yes, no. Does he do this? Well, sometimes, sometimes, yes, no, blah, blah, blah. And when you get to the part where you're, you've topped out, then that's the section that you go to on the website. Okay? Now, not to say that you wouldn't go to other places on the website, and not to say that kids have splintered skills. A lot of kids, they may not be cut, they may, it may not be cut and dry with them. So what you do is, you, you do the, that, that can also, and I know lots of teachers, and I'm amazed, I know lots of teachers who use this as kind of an assessment. They do it at the beginning of the year, and then they do it again at the end of the year. So that they're able to show some progress. Now, we didn't intend it to be that way, but it's, it's done that way. And it's, you know, it makes me excited to think that it's being used in that way that people can show progress because of that, okay? But they, it really was designed so that you would know where on this website to get started. Because remember that 15 minutes or less that you have? I wanted to make that easier for you. We felt like you had to, you know, I'm down and dirty, I gotta have something now. All right? So, it's, and that's on the front, web, uh, front page, the home page of the website right here at the top. The next is the steps to literacy, and my friend Lisa has copied that out for you. That's that one that's big. The steps to literacy. Now how you can use that is this. This has every strategy, may I borrow yours please? Thank you. This has every strategy that's on that website and the different stages. So what you could do is post this up in your classroom and you have Sally that's here, Sarah that's here, John that's here, and Frank that's there. And you could put their names up at the top so that anybody who walks in your classroom can know, oh, these are some things I could do with them. Got it? Those also have live links to it so that if you have it online and you click on it, anything in blue is going to take you directly to where that is on the website. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> it gets better. <laughs> Stick with me. Remember what I had said just a little while ago when I was talking about the website or talking about the, where we were coming from? It's not on that. It's shifting the perspective page. Level C by you stretch it out, sister. You stretch it out. And I can, you know, when I stopped teaching, I could take any little piece of fuzz and make a learning experience out of it. 
everything is a teachable moment every way and I could jump from standards I came from Kentucky we're the ones that did that access to general curriculum you're welcome <laughs> yeah it never steers you wrong when you focus on the kid it never steers you wrong and I can make it. So it's, it's in that definition and in you thinking about what does that actually mean when you're looking at that standard? What do they want from this? And then you even may have to go next door to the third grade classroom and third grade teacher and say, okay, what does this standard mean to you? What does it mean to your kids? How do you do that? When it talks about this standard, what does that mean? And then from there, you think about how does that relate to my kid? How can I get that point across to them? Does that make sense? Okay. And then you stretch it out. You know, the, it, it, you can do it. It just, you have to be creative. And if today, if I don't give you anything else, I give you permission to play and permission to get creative with it and to have fun because the other piece of that people is you have to remember if you're not having fun if you're so oh these standards oh, oh, then what do you think that kid's going to do so break out of that mold and have fun with this it's a blast once you get started once you go to that part of your brain and start getting creative with it, oh, you can have a blast. And I'm going to show you lots of examples. The things that I don't have in your PowerPoint are a bunch of pictures that you're going to go, oh, 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 well, I can do. And it starts there. On this website, we did put lots and lots of examples and lots of different articles. They're not the, they're not the research articles. You don't have time for that. I'm not saying they're not important because they are to academia, but they're not so much when you're out in the field and trying to make it survival. So what you needed were those hands-on 15-minute little articles that are user-friendly. That's what's on this website. Okay? So on the Shifting the Perspectives page, anything that's in blue in here on this page are links to something else. Anything that's green is a pop-up that gives definitions. So what do you mean by joint attention? What do you mean by whatever? And it has a little pop-up that gives like a definition and maybe some examples. So that that gives you that what we're doing is stretching your mindset of what literacy is. Because what our mindset of literacy is typically developing. And then when we start looking at our population and going, ah, that, that doesn't work. What we need to do is broaden that out and think about it a little bit. You're just taking it, all the information you know, and do it this way. Does that help? Okay. Hopefully, I'll make a believer out of you before this day's over. Or at least willing to try a little bit. How's that? And maybe you take it back down to that for this kid. That's what you have to do. You have to reel it in. Yeah. Because the, the general ed curriculum is way out there. You got to reel it back and go, mm, let's look at this kid and let's look at realism. Because that's where we live. We got to get real. But you also can get creative. And when you get creative with it, that's where it takes off for you. So today, I'm giving every one of you permission to play. All right? So, in here is the literacy as a right. It's the Literacy Bill of Rights that says every kid has the right to be literate or to be working towards literacy. Okay, so that, I'll move on. These same things are the things that I said. Here's the other literacy checklist. So this just frames what we think about literacy instruction and how this website is designed okay then we go into the different 
aspects of it. That's where that checklist comes in. You do the checklist and then you go to the place where it is. So all of these pages, and what we did, remember I told you we did the stages of literacy development and then we married it with those components. We did not do phonics and phonemic awareness because we didn't feel like it was applicable to our population. We thought about perhaps in the future, and it may still, in the future, they may expand it out and put more of that in there. But right now, we made it where it's building a foundation, early emergent, emergent, then writing, vocabulary development, comprehension, fluency, and then expanding literacy. And expanding literacy is where you really start talking about the general ed curriculum. That's where you're going to get the standards and the core, core content and all that stuff. Okay, and that's kind of your, a little bit further down, but those guys that you're going, you asked me about one of your students um, in yellow. Paula. Okay, Paula, you asked me about that. They're probably, you want to look in the building a foundation because that's going to help you. Right, I just looked through the checklist and that's exactly where it is. Okay, so now let me tell you how this works. When you go do the checklist and then you come here, you're going to come to a page and they all look the same. Okay? They're all laid out the very same way. So the first paragraph on here talks about literacy on that level or in that component. So it's, it that's just talks about that. Then it's what does that look like for typically developing kids? And then the last one is what does it look like for our population? So that just is the setup. It's three paragraphs. Boom, boom, boom. Okay. All right. Now I know where you are on that. Then as you do that, then these are strategies that you use in that to help these kids to further them along on the continuum. So it may be that you need to back up and build a trusting relationship with this kid. Well, how do I do that? So in, when you click on the strategy, it takes you to this page and it's what to do. So it's task analyzed for you. Do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. Then if that doesn't work for you, down below are things to consider. And when you do the things to consider, those are questions to ask yourself because it's not the kid's fault. It's not the kid's fault that they couldn't do this. It's on us. And maybe it's because we haven't positioned the kid in the right way. Maybe we're not in their visual field. Maybe we're not doing this, that, or the other. Maybe I'm not close enough for them to even know I'm in the room with them. So it's those things that you have to ask yourself, am I doing those things? Did I think about that? Because the ownership on them not succeeding is on you. You're responsible for that. So therefore, this just helps to break it down for you even more. It could be, let's go back to my charge kid. They can't sit up and do this. They have to be in the floor. Well, maybe I have to get in the floor and instruct them. It's been done. Happens every day. But if that's what it takes to get that kid to what they need, then that's what we do. Now, if that doesn't help you, at every single one of the strategies is the always ask yourself. And if you will look in your thing, you have a document that's called always ask yourself. It's a one pager. It looks like this. Okay, if you look at that and post it, post it up on your wall. And if you look at those questions and ask yourself those questions, am I doing every one of those? You automatically have raised the bar on literacy instruction. Automatically, you will raise that bar if you do these questions. If you just put them in your brain as you're doing instruction with kids, then these things will automatically raise that bar, okay? Okay, so we've gone over kind of the first page. We've gone into the strategies. I've kind of shown you what each strategy, like I said, anything in 
with a link is in blue, anything with a um, green is a pop-up. So it just kind of tells you a little bit about what that means by sensory learning channels. What does it mean by learning styles? So it's just giving you that information and then the things to consider and always ask yourself. Now I'm going to go back out to the home pages and each one of these are set up the same way. Down at the bottom we have what we called the lovely um, green bar items. And on those, you just click on that you, and this is related skills. So this kind of speaks to the IEP and some of those things that you would put on an IEP. And that's how they relate with that stage of literacy development. Those are the things that you might target as an IEP goal in the different domains. So there's, there's that. Okay, and then we have examples. And these are just a few examples with a few thoughts. There are, uh, sometimes it takes you to another website, sometimes it does other things. There are a few video clips, a few examples that way. Maybe it's something that you'd like to see about other things, articles, and these are those user-friendly. One, two, three page things. Occasionally it's a chapter in a book, but not very often. Um, they're, they're those user-friendly, like I said. And then the additional resources that could be in this particular one, these are modules on communication. Um, they're, these either take you to other websites that may be of interest or maybe sometimes it's like a book that we might recommend for that, okay? So that's how the website is kind of set up. Um, in the bottom part of this is the planning section. And this, is, this has um, templates. It's built a little differently but what it does is go into unit planning. So looking at those grade bands and thinking about those grade bands and those core, those content areas, the, the standards and the grade bands that they're in. And you know, a lot of times we have kids that are from first to fifth grade in, in our self-contained classrooms or they're at middle school kids that you've got several different grades in there. So this takes you through units that could be planned in those grade bands that speak to those core content areas. And it, there are lots of templates in each one. There's an overview, examples, and templates. And they go into unit planning, tiered planning, so how you would do it for several different kids, daily planning, and then collaborative, how you would do it with others. So this, this section in itself was like a gift from God. Now I do have to back up and tell you, I started telling you the story of how we developed this website, and um, then I got off track because that's who I am and what I do. So when we went through all of the research articles and looked at them, all of behind blindness, deafness, all, all of the holy host of others, then we, were t we came up with performance indicators that went with our outcome. And in that, we knew that every, not every deaf-blind project really understood our new literacy. Not every, every people, you know, all the people. So what we did was we put strategies into those performance indicators. And our director said, well, that's really nice. Take them out because they are performance indicators. You don't need those strategies in there. And I kept saying, but that's what teachers want. That's what teachers need. They need those strategies. So these strategies sat on my desk for like three years and I was real frustrated with, but this is what teachers need. This is, they don't care about our stupid performance indicators. They need strategies. And so with that, we decided as a work group, we'd build a website that would do it. And that's how this was born. Okay, so that's, that's where it really became a true labor, labor of love. Now, if you're looking for cute little activities that you need to do, there are a thousand other websites that do this. 
What this does is it gives you that idea, the thought process behind. It gives you strategies of how you would go about teaching X. Okay? When you go to other websites, now then, after you do this and think through it, then you could go over to Pathways to Literacy through the Perkins website. Or you can go to, you know, different websites that would give you teacher ideas for different things. But you need to know these ideas and these strategies first. Because once you have this in your head, then making those activities that's going to target it, we've given you a few examples, but it's mu this is more about the instruction behind it. Okay? So, any questions about the website or how it was built? Uh, you can play on it for hours and hours and hours. There, you know, that's the other feedback I get from all over is, oh my gosh, I've never gotten to the end of this. It just keeps going. And we really did try to pack it with as much information so you could go to, grab things, think about, oh, that's how I could do that. This is how I could teach that. This is where this kid is, and these are the strategies that could really help them. Okay? So I'm going to go back to this. And we've talked about the different stages of literacy development. I've shown you the website. Now we're going to spend some time down here on this foundational stuff. Because this is the foundation of literacy. And in building this, that's how you're going to build how to do literacy instruction. All right? Developing literacy skills, it starts with knowing your learner. If you don't know your learner, you don't know how to reach them. But you've got to know them. And you have to think about them in several different ways. These kids are complex. They don't come with an owner's manual, unfortunately. And so it takes thinking outside the box. But you've got to think about and know that learner and what makes them tick. Where do they see? How do they do that? What, what are they doing with this? How come they're doing it this way? So you've got to know all of those things. That's where your team support. And you've got to talk to each other. You've got to use your team. And I know it's hard. It's hard and the only time we ever see teams are in an IEP meeting where everybody comes in with their little piece of the pie. They do their little party piece and you really pass them in the hallway. You don't have time. But you really have to anchor it in asking. The reason why I'm able to do these things is because I was that teacher who could never stay in her discipline. You know, I had my bag of tricks. I know those bag of tricks. I don't want to know about yours. OT, why do we do this? I had a kid with, who was a poster child for sensory integration back before it was a thing, before anybody knew that. And OTs were first coming in. I'm telling my age now. But when OTs were first coming into school, and there was a little guy who came to our school. Fifth, er, he was in kindergarten. I had two little deaf guys. I called them Little Anthony and the Imperials. So, Little Anthony and the Imperials were deaf, and, and we were in about first grade about that time. But Josh came in as a kindergartner, and he would come in. He spoke only in vowels. He knew what he was saying, but it was only in vowels. And then he would just wreak havoc on this kindergarten room and dive under the desk. And like I said, this was back before, this was back in the day, this was in the 80s. And nobody is like, whoa, well, I'm doing language all day. So I said, I'll take him. And I had seen an OT in, a, in the, the uh, more severe, profound classroom. And she was swinging a kid one day, and I was like, well, why are you doing that? And she said, well, it stimulates his vestibular system and it helps produce speech. Okay. Well, I remembered that. And I said, I will take this kid if I get an OT evaluation because he was speaking only in vowels. She came in and she said, oh, he is a walking poster child for sensory integration. What's that? So she became, I 
took him into my classroom and she would come once a week and she would do all kinds of things to develop a sensory diet. And I, every time that she would start something, I was, what are we doing? Well, that stimulates da, 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 and proprioceptive and, and vestibular and yeah. And I'm like, no, no, did, did you remember that I teach special ed? I, I, bring it down. What does that mean in English? How low can you go? Because you need to tell me that. And so with that, I was able to understand then and use that in my classroom. And not only with that kiddo, but then there were all kinds of other little guys that had sensory issues. And so I started using those little tools with my other kids. And it just blossomed from there. Then I get my deafblind kids. Hello, I'm already prepared. I didn't know it at the time. But these kids are sensory systems, just walking sensory nightmares. Awesome. Awesome. Because you think about it, we're all sensory animals. I mean, I've got two knitters here. I bet I've got some doodlers. I've probably got some hair twisters. I definitely have this kind of thing going on. We've got all that sensory stuff going on. We just don't think about how that regulates us. That's regulating each and every one of you in your own special little ways. But you've got to think about that, and we don't. We typically don't because we're, we just got to get through this day. A lot of times we're in survival mode just trying to make it through. So think about those things. But it starts with knowing your learner. That's where you, you looked at the thing. Okay. So in building a foundation, the three strategies are developing a trusting relationship, embedding opportunities to communicate, and designing activities that are meaningful. Now this is how low can you go, kids, right? This is where we start. And why do we say developing a trusting relationship? we got to stop and think about the child's prior experiences. And we as teachers don't think about that too much. We're thinking, we're in school. Schools are loving, nurturing, wonderful places. Guess what? That kid doesn't know that. How many of your kids started out in the NICU? Raise your hand if you had kids that were had, started out in the NICU. Yeah, quite a few of them. There's a lot of pain that is involved in the NICU. And kids may not really, they never forget that subconsciously. I had a mother tell me one time about a, a child, she, a her child, who aged 10 or so, he had his AFOs, and every time they put him on him, he'd scream. And so they would try their best. They'd do all kinds of things. They'd refitted. They'd taken him back multiple times, all this other good stuff, until the mother realized that the Velcro ripping was the same sound that happened in the NICU before they did some kind of procedure, the tape. It sounded just exactly the same way as that. And the child remembered it from NICU. Ooh, I got it. That's right. You got to stop and think about that kid. Why should they trust you? And what do we do to kids? We go racing up. We got to go to the bathroom. Come on, we got to change you. And we take them out and we flip them out and move them through space without giving them any cue. And it's not that we're not caring, lovable, wonderful people. It really isn't. It's because our mind is on 1,500 other things. So in developing that trusting relationship, the first thing I got to do is I got to slow it down. And you know what? When I interact with these kids, the first thing I have to do is stop, drop, and nothing else in the world matters except that child. Nothing else. 
I'm not thinking about what I'm having for supper that night, that I've got to go take the kids to soccer practice, that I've got to do this, that, and the other, that I've got an IEP meeting, that I haven't finished the IEP, that all, uh, 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 all the things that are spinning in my head. I trained myself when it was time to interact with that kid, then it was me and him. And I'm down there, and I'm right here, and he's got my full-on attention. Now that interaction may last two minutes, but in that two minutes, he's got me. And that's hard to do, but if you train yourself to do that, then automatically that kid's going to zone in and start working with you. And you're going to get much more out of them if you stop the, the verbiage that's going on in your head. And really zone in. And not stop and think about, oh, I've got all these other things and there are 15 other kids. and ah, Right? I've got to stop and automatically do that. Because that's how we build trust. Knowing that I'm a communication partner and I'm always, when I get in your zone, baby, I'm always going to be your communication partner. That's powerful to a kid. How often do they get that? Because we don't think about it. We don't think about it. I'm also, also going to be predictable. I'm going to let them know each and every time I'm always going to do it the same way. And when I'm not, when I can't, I'm going to let them know that too. It's not going to be the same way today. I'm also going to let them know when I'm not. I'm going to keep in mind their past experiences. So if they've been in the NICU, I'm going to remember that they may not trust me. I need to work on being trusting, trusted. I'm not going to take it personally because it really isn't about me. It really is because they've had so many other things. And quite frankly, I know kids who haven't had a wonderful school experience either. So why should they trust? I'm going to be dependable. I'm going to be responsive. Even if I don't know exactly what that motion means, I'm going to acknowledge that they've made that motion and I'm going to let them know, I'm trying to figure it out, bud. I really am with you. And then I'm going to have to first gain their attention. Because what do we do? Once again, our brains are going, -da 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 -da, and I've got 1,500 things that I need to do today with this kid and with this classroom. So I go on autopilot, and I'm starting to do it, right? What I need to do first is gain their attention, and that might mean, even though they know me, I've been their teacher for five years. Whenever I start those interactions where it's just me and them, then I'm going to drop. First thing I'm doing is down in her eyes. Right? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> My 60-year-old body is saying, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> so I'm going to get down, and I'm going to put my hand right here on her shoulder. Why? And I'm not putting a whole lot of pressure, but I am putting a little bit of pressure. Because sometimes, think about their sensory system, sometimes it takes that kid a little bit of time to get it all together so that they can pay attention to me. And so I've got to think about that. I've also got to let them know, and you will know, you'll feel it. They may tense up, they may relax. It just depends on the kid and the circumstances. And it depends on, some of them are little Roger Rabbits and they're running all over. Others are very slow. But what happens is that we don't give them enough time because we've got a schedule we've got to stay on. I would much rather see you do four activities with a kid in a day than to do 90. And especially if you're doing it this way. Because they have to figure out what are you doing. And once they get that and they get that rhythm, then it's a beautiful thing. But I'm going to gain her attention this way, and I'm going to go down her arm, and I'm going to say, hi, Ruby, and I'm going to put her name sign on her, because that is her name. 
it's Nancy. And then usually I have like a bracelet, something that identifies me, my personal identifier. I'm going to let her feel my personal identifier. Now, as we're doing our interaction, then if I need to, let's say the principal comes to the room, what do we usually do? We break off and go, right? right. And I've left her hanging. She's going, what just happened? I'm going to stop myself, and I don't care if it's the president. I don't care who it is that comes to my doorstep. I'm here with Ruby, and I'm going to say, Ruby, we have to wait. I need to take a break. I'll be right back. Then I'm going to go over, and I'm going to do what I need to do. When I come back, I'm going to say, Ruby, it's Nancy. I'm going to let her know each and every time who I am. Because, you know, here's the other thing. Folks, we don't usually let them even know who we are, much less the other kids. I've known classrooms that have been together for years and they don't know each other's names. It's because we haven't spent the time to give everybody an identifier and give them time to get to know the other kids and what their names are. If we can't label their names and let them know that, why do we care what the standards are? We got to start there. That's where we start, is with this trusting relationship. And it's those little things that help build it. You know, I've always said I love to think about how to make books and do different things. I've always wanted to do an experience books about fire drills, tornado drills, earthquake drills. All of those things, because what do we do? We know as teachers, we know when they're going to be. But what happens when the alarm sounds? We go over and rip Miss Ruby up out of her wheelchair and go running or whatever we need to do. We don't give them anything, so they're in this mode, and they stay there for hours because it's like, whoa, what's going to happen next? You've ripped me up, you've taken me outside in 20-degree weather, and now... <laughs> You brought me back, what else is in store today? We don't think about that stuff. We got to start thinking about those things to help kids. Now I'll get off that soapbox, okay? Sorry. But, yes ma'am? What was the sign that you... That's called tactile, that, uh, yes. Um, tactile signing. That's where my hands are doing that and I'll do it for you. My hands are here, I'm also, and it's, it's interactive sign. So I'm interactive. Coactive, I'm going to go behind you. Right. Underneath. And I'm going to go underneath, hand under hand. Instead of hand over hand, I'm going to go under. Why am I doing that? Because if you think about taking your hand, take your hand and put it there. What happens when you do that? Somebody grabs your hand. What's your first response? What are you doing? Or you're going to force my hand into, into goo that I don't even know what this is, lady. Uh-uh. Right? If you do underhand, then I'm the one that's feeling the goo first. They also can feel the motion that I'm doing. Right? They can feel how that feels. So, in this interactive, I'm going to take your hands and I'm doing on, my name on me, your name on you. Okay? And I'm guiding you through. What usually happens with hand under hand, and I don't know, I'll probably it goes later on in this, but come up here and I'll demonstrate. Okay, with hand under hand, I'm going to do this. And because you're an adult, you're, then I would take you like this and do the stuff. And I'm going to, let's go over here. So you've got a hold of her thumbs. I have a hold of her thumbs. Because now, I've got a lot of kids would you please try to, try to pull away? Right. How much pressure am I putting? Enough I can't pull away. Okay. 
So what happens there is you do that and then as you're doing, as I'm picking up the pen, and I've got her thumb still because I don't want her to leave. I want her to feel what we're doing. She feels how we do. I hold the thumb. Okay. Now, once they figure out, and I've, thanks. What, once they figure out that you're trying to do something, and I've done this with thousands of kids. Once they figure out, then they start seeking it. And they will naturally put their hand over you because they know somewhere you're trying to give me something. You're trying to tell me something. You're trying to communicate with me. What is it? So they're going to start sliding their hands that way. Sometimes it takes a while. It goes back to this trusting relationship. You've got to earn that trust and earn that, oh, this is something, oh, Okay, now I see what we're doing. And then they will. But at first, yeah, they're going to pull back because I don't, know, I don't get what you're trying to do. Uh-uh. But if you hold that thumb just right here and practice with each other, just take a minute to practice with, with her. It's your right hand, their right hand. Come here, first of all. Miss Tammy? Yes. First of all, it's her right, her right hand and my right hand. Got it? I'm sliding it under and I'm taking her thumb. Now with a smaller child, I'm going to do it this way. And that's called coactive signing. Where I'm going to show her what motions she needs to do. So, if I want her to say, I want food, I'm going to do it that way. That's something that she would want to say. If I want to say something as the adult, I'm going to get in front of her. And I'm going to talk to her this way. And see, her hands are still on top of mine, but I'm talking to her. That's me talking. If it's something that she, I want her to say... Then I'm going to switch back over, and I call this my weight reduction plan. <laughs> because you do a lot of back and forth and in and out. And so it's like, I, don't, I didn't need to go to the gym at that time because I was rolling on the floor and doing all that stuff, right? But that way, if it's something that she's, I'm wanting her to do, I'm kind of modeling it to her what that looks like. What do you say in this situation? You say, I want whatever it is. Okay? And that one's called what? Yeah. Co-active. Co-active, Co-active is when I'm doing it. And with little bitty guys, it's pretty easy because you're behind them. And you're kind of shielding your body just the same as theirs. And then interactive is in front. Woo! Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. So in developing that trusting relationship... I'm going to expect, there's the first thing, I'm going to expect, acknowledge, or I'm going to expect, wait for, and acknowledge their responses. And sometimes, here's what I would suggest you do with these kids, especially the more complex kids, videotape yourself. And nobody likes that. I don't like it today. And I guarantee you, Mr. Dale, I probably will never see any of these because I don't like to do that. But videotape yourself not to see that you've got glamour shots or any of that kind of stuff. It's much more about when you are working with the kid and you think you've waited long enough and you turn to get something, you're missing things. You're missing what they're doing. And it could be that these guys, it takes them that long to get their act together. Some guys, it takes up to a minute. Here's a case in point. I had a little guy that I knew who was standing. He, he had autism, had a few little words, and he's over in his classroom, and the windows are open. The bus is pulling up. So he's standing there and he's got his hands in the window and he's jumping up and down and kind of ha 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 and the window slams. As I was standing there, 
you could almost see the little synapses, whatever, the impulse going up to, you know, it goes up to the brain and then goes back down. And it happens like that. You could almost see it ride up his head, hit his brain, and then come back down before he said, ah! it, that took a, a full 30 seconds. And this was a kid who was up and walking and doing and all this other good stuff. Think about some of our more involved kids and just how long it takes for that process to happen. They're not wired the same way we are, folks. That may not, that impulse may not act immediately. So we have to stop and think about that. Okay? I want to identify, in building the trusting relationship, I want to identify their likes and dislikes. Then I want to allow the child to direct the conversations. This is it first. Remember, I'm building that trust. How do I build the trust with any of you? We talk about your interest. I talk about my interest, right? We find that common ground of what we like, both of us, that shared thing. That's how we develop our friendships. That's how we develop relationships. So I want to identify the likes and dislikes so that maybe I have things to talk to him about. And I'm going to allow them to follow that lead. I very much, I, I do, I'm asked to go in and, well, what do I do with this kid? You know, and it's like, well, I kind of need to like meet the kid first. It would help. So I go in and a lot of times I'm asked to, d to make, well, fix it. But what, what do you do? Well, I don't know the kid. And I'm not a real good one to just sit and observe. I, I need to get in his brain. It just tickles me to death to get in a kid's brain and play. Just, I love to see what's knocking in there. And I also have to think about, hmm, what, what's, what is he, what's going on? So usually when I meet a kid for the first time, I go in and I'm going to do the same thing they're doing. So if the kid's rocking like this, I'm going to get up uh, next to him and I'm going to kind of rock. Or if they're doing this, I'm going to do this. And they kind of look at you like, wait, that's my gig. You, you, you're, you're talking my language. Nobody usually does that. So I've just gained their attention, right? So from that, then I start like they're doing this. Well, I may do it this way. And we start this turn-taking thing. Because what is turn-taking? It's the foundation of communication, right? It's the foundation of literacy. It's that turn-taking. That's how we get back and forth. That's how then I'm going to, they, they usually, they're doing this, I have them do this, or they're doing this, and I have them do this, and they'll do this, but then they'll go right back to theirs. And it's like, oh, okay, I get that. But it's that same, that turn taking, that movement back and forth that helps to get it. You're going to have those frequent conversations like that. It may be just patting things, scratching on things, Different things like that. If that's where they are, then that's what I'm going to do. Those are those conversations. I've had great conversations and never said a word. It's more about, wow, there's a connection there. Then I'm going to incorporate that music and rhythm and play. I'm going to have fun with it. Because, you know, if I'm having fun, they're going to have fun. So I'm excited about it. I'm excited about talking to them. I need to know, what's your story, kiddo? Why do you like cookie sheets? Why do you like to flip them back and forth? Huh. And see, I'll do that, and I do it for two reasons. Number one is, that's your gig. I want to see what it is that they like about it. Oh, well, that is kind of fun. Huh. Well, because I'm, I'm that warped too. But 
just really getting into their head and figuring out that kind of stuff. But that's how you build trust. That's how you get that communication. Uh, okay. Got it. Now I'm going to go to communication and embedding those opportunities. So I'm going to identify their preferred communication methods. Oh, I don't know if it's, I'm sure it is somewhere in here. If you look in your packet, you have a thing called likes and dislikes. It's a two-pager. It also is stapled. And it looks like this. Thank you. Looks like this. And see, usually when I ask people, what, what does he like? Oh, he likes music. Well, okay. I don't care if he's stone cold deaf. He likes music. Okay. That's cool. What kind of music? Does he like the theme from Barney? Does he like rock? Does he like classical? Does he like country? What kind? Does he like fast beats, slow beats? What, what is it about music? So this kind of takes that and it separates out all of these different things and asks you to look at it from a sensory perspective also. So it's what kind of foods? And, and from there you're looking at taste and texture. Does he like things that are hard? Does he like things that are soft? What, what is it that he likes? Do I see a pattern in there? That's where I'd ask the OT, come in here and help me out with this, you know? And this is where everybody on the team looks at that. What smells does he like? Most of the time we don't think about smells. But, and I wouldn't suggest because you could send somebody into sensory overload pretty quickly, but let's do all these smells. Let's figure this out. That can really, really make a kid throw up if you do too many of those. So be careful with that. Touch, what kind of touch does he like? Does he like light touch? Does he like somebody who really gives a firm? Does he like hugs? What kind of textures? Does he like soft things against his body? Does he not? Those are the things that you're looking at. What kind of movement? Does he like rocking? Does he like bouncing, swinging? What does he like? Because you're going to use, what, and then the, the second page is what does he doesn't like? What doesn't he like? There we go. Edit that, please. <laughs> so you're looking at what he does like, what he doesn't. That's how you're going to start your instruction. You're going to use this as your road map. Okay? Thank you, ma'am. Okay. When I embed those opportunities to communicate, I'm going to identify their methods. And there are lots of ways to do that. I'll show you a slide here in a minute that has some links. Always identify myself, just like I did with Miss Ruby. I'm always going to let them know who I am. It's me, and I'm going to say my name. It's Miss, it's Miss Steele, or Miss Nancy, or whatever they want to call me. Then I'm going to help them understand their role as a communication partner. Because a lot of times they're not aware that they're really expected to do anything or that they are a communication partner. And I do that through touch cues. A lot of times I do it this way. I'm going to use, Miss Tammy, I'm going to use you again. And when I'm signing to her and saying, Hi, Tammy, it's Nancy. And I'm going to put my hands out there. Then I'm going to, oh, I'm sorry. We probably need to do that. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Tammy. It's Nancy. And I'm going to put my hands there. And she's sitting there. I'm going to do this to her and flip my hands like that to let her know, yo, chick, your turn. <laughs> and then I'm going to wait. And if she doesn't do it, then I'm going to model to her what I want her to do. Oh, you need to tell me. Hi. 
okay? So I'm going to let her know I'm expecting something. Or I may tap the top. Or I may, if I'm trying to get her out of her wheelchair, I'm going to maybe tap her here on the shoulder and say, we're going to take you out of your wheelchair. I'm always going to let her know what's going to happen next. Always. Because that's just common courtesy. And also that helps her to regulate her body and get it ready. So that she knows, oh, something's expected of me. You're about to do something. Well, instead of me just laying there like this, then I'm going to be doing this. I'm going to tap her shoulder. And hopefully she's going to learn to anticipate when I do that what she's supposed to do. But I have to let her know what that is. I need you to lean up. And I'm going to wait. Yay! Thanks. Does that make sense? It's those little things that make the difference with kids. It's expecting. I expect it from you. I want something. I don't care what it is. And when they do it, I'm going to acknowledge it and celebrate it. That's right. Good. You know what I want from you. And then I'm going to continue to have that conversation just like I'd have the conversation with you. I'm going to do those things because I'm going to look at them as a communication partner. And we're, it's a two-way street. Today it's not because I'm in lecture mode. But typically it's I would hush and let you talk. And then it's a back and forth. So I'm going to do the same thing with kids. But I'm expecting it along the way. And then I'm going to wait. And if I know the response of this kid or how long it takes them to get their act together, I'm going to wait some more. And after I've waited a certain amount of time, and you know those kids, you know which kids you really need to wait. Maybe I haven't. But what we do is we get in autopilot and we're running, 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 and we miss those opportunities with kids. Okay? Here are some different ways that you can figure out. And these resources are found on the literacy website in that first section, probably down in the examples or the additional resources, that kind of thing. One of them is ways of communicating. Which different ways, what sensory channels are they using? And there's a link to it that shows that little worksheet that you can work out. And sometimes they express one way and they receive a whole nother channel. Sometimes it's different. Sometimes a kid can be, have a significant vision loss, but yet vision is their primary mode that they get their information. I'm preaching to the choir, I know. Communication map is also on there, and that looks expressively and receptively at different ways that kids communicate. And then there's the communication matrix. And how many of you know that communication matrix? Isn't it a lovely little item? It's a beautiful little tool. And if you don't know it, it's at commu um, communicationmatrix.org. And you can do a profile. It takes about 20 minutes, and it feels kind of redundant. But after you do it, you come out with this lovely picture that shows you things that they've already mastered, things that are emerging in their skills, and then things that they're not ready for. We, you, and that's for, it's based off of typically developing kids from birth to two. So if they're that pre-linguistic, then that's, that's where you start with them. But you start and you figure out where they are. And a lot of times you find out, oh, wait a minute, I'm way above where this kiddo is. But that's the conference you missed last fall. We'll move on. Okay. Here again, when I'm doing those communication, I'm going to expect, wait, and acknowledge. I'm going to put meaning into actions. And then I'm going to provide the vocabulary for it. Because what we typically do is react. And we may say something, but we aren't very targeted in trying to get them to understand this is the vocabulary that goes with it. And a lot of times we don't give them names. 
names of people, names of objects, names of this, that, and the other. We just kind of go through space. And once again, there's that incidental learning stuff. We take it for granted that they know that this is a cup and this is a straw and there's water in here and ice. We take it for granted because we know it and we didn't, nobody sat down and said, this is a cup, right? Well, sometimes we have to do that. We give them cups every single day. Have we given them the word? Ooh. See, we got to let them know what those things are. How are they going to build their vocabulary if they don't know the everyday objects they're acquainted with? So don't assume that they know it. Okay? Then I'm going to use that consistent, repetitive language. I'm always going to use it. I'm always going to present it in the same way. And I'm always going to use that vocabulary. And sometimes, I always use my voice. I don't care if they're deaf. I always use my voice, and here's why. Number one, then my facial expression and body language match whatever I'm saying. They also may be getting some cues from my actions. It also paces me. It slows me down. I also, you know, we're told bombard them with speech, bombard them, bombard them. With some of these guys, I cut the verbiage. I cut it down to noun action. Boom. Because if you don't do that, then they, you know, it's just like wah, 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 the Charlie Brown, right? Because they don't get it. Because you've, they've shut down because you've put too much in there. So slow down, back up that, that verbiage, and drop it into just some things like that. But I'm also going to be real consistent. Every time that I give them this, I'm going to say the same thing until I know they have it. Then I can start moving into other things. I'm also going to provide them with choices. Why? Because then choices you have to initiate. Also, choices help you to learn. Sometimes we make bad choices. I made one a few, about 20 years ago. Well, no, longer than that. I made one about 30, 40 years ago. I got rid of it about 20 years ago. <laughs> But I had to live with that choice for a while because <laughs> I made a bad one. <laughs> I was like, how do you get rid of children? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm dealing with a 12-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> oh, may the force be with you, baby. <laughs> Woo. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> Somebody took out the trash. It was all right. <laughs> Moving on. Sorry. <laughs> But what we do, and we're so guilty because we are loving, caring, nurturing people, is we set up kids to not fail. But where do you learn the most? Uh-huh, I learn I'm never going to do that again. I made a much better choice the second time around. Much better. Because I stopped and dropped and thought, mm, okay, we're going to look at this from a different way. Same thing with kids. Sometimes, because of their disabilities, we're really bad about not wanting to upset the apple cart. And we want to make this life for you just as easy as we can. And it goes back to that learned helplessness. It very much goes back to there. Sometimes kids need to sit and waller in their mistakes. Just a little bit. And because you know what? We won't be making that mistake again. Think about it. And let them fail. It's okay. Permission. Okay? Then I'm going to use communication for a variety of purposes. So I'm not just going to keep it to the script. Sometimes we're going to do some crazy stuff and have fun. Because that also gains their attention. I'm going to use it in any different way. Sometimes I do communication dictionaries. And now that we do have 
all kinds of different cloud things and ways that we can do this. We can share with each other. Um, a lot of schools use Google Drive to share information with other service providers that you don't necessarily get to see. So I'm the teacher of the deaf and I never get to see the TVI. But if I have that Google Drive and we've got a communication dictionary in there that lets us know their system, lets them know the different modes, lets them know how, what they say express, what they understand receptively, what they can say or do expressively, how, what that looks like, because a lot of our kids don't have sign or don't have the mobility to be able to make those signs and sometimes they make those signs in another way. It's like this could be more, right? Or this could be more or whatever. You need to take a video of it, whatever, describe it in a communication dictionary so that others will know. Because you know what? I may be their teacher. I may have been their teacher the last three years. And I know everything they do. I know every little motion they make. I know everything, that, that what that means. Especially as a mama. You know all of those things and you don't even think about it. Because you have, are so wrapped up in that kid, you know exactly what. But let's say a babysitter comes. They might not know that that means that. So there needs to be somewhere where it's scripted out for others to know. Or let's say that kid moves and, so in, and he comes with a communication dictionary. Oh, happy day. Because what typically happens is, I have this kid for three years, he moves on, and it takes them another six months to a year to figure out. So if it's already in there, I already know those things, then I can hit the floor running. So think about, and it is a gift to those that come out. So early interventionists, please start it there and move it forward. I just wanted to add to that. I had a student that was using um, tactile symbols for communication. And when he went on to the next school, they weren't using those, but I had video of it, so I was able to show them what he was capable of. Wow. So it's not just like, so they do it, but it's so they can believe in the capability. Absolutely. Absolutely. You definitely want to. When you have those, especially if you're using tactile symbols, you want that written word somewhere, not for the kids so much. Yeah, you want to label things for kids, but you really want it for the adults. Because how are they going to know what that little swirly thing that's on that card means? Some of those things get really abstract, so you need to write those words on there. In your folder also is a sheet that's called the symbol or symbols hierarchy. And it talks about, it just is a snapshot of, it goes from actual objects to partial objects to on up to actual photographs, then line drawings, text, print. So there's a hierarchy to this. And you want to make sure that as you're thinking about communication and you're using these modes, that these, you know, you want to try to get them to the least restrictive. But sometimes kids will always use the actual object. And that's okay. But you need to think about that, okay? Okay, so in designing meaningful experiences, we're going to identify, yes, some? and that happens a lot, and a lot of times what happens is a speech therapist is in school, and then the parents also have a speech therapist outside, and there's conflicting how we're doing this and all that good stuff, so, because it really does, it, that, because can you imagine, and it happens all the time. I'm the teacher of the deaf, I'm going to come in and I'm going to give you this sign. The TVI comes in and the same thing, she's going to do it differently. And then mom comes in and she does it another way. Mm -hmm. And the kid is like, whoa, you want me to be trilingual here. 
<laughs> you know, what, what is this? That's why you want to do a communication dictionary so that he's getting the same thing from all of us. And it's not, okay, I got to learn your language and now I got to learn yours and now I got to learn yours. They're having enough problems. So once again, that's, that's on us. We're going to own it, okay? So in those meaningful experiences, you're identifying those likes and dislikes. You're going to use those preferences to make it relevant and fun. You're going to start there. You start where they like and you move them into other things. You move them into the common core. <laughs> because you got to start there in building that relationship and letting them know, oh, okay, this is what you mean by. Then you can move them into other things. You want to determine those sensory learning channels and their learning styles. And that's on the website about how you do that. Then you're going to use age-appropriate things. And sometimes that's hard to stretch it there, but you're going to try your best. Because the other thing is, if the kid's in high school, I'm going to use things that's going to make the other kids around them want to potentially be a, a um, communication partner. You know, if, if we're talking about the common core or whatever and having to teach to the standards, if, if they're supposed to be doing graphs and that kind of stuff, then I'm going to go out and we, we say the kid loves music, then maybe we're going to take them out into, the, into other classrooms and have them take a poll as to what kind of music do you like. Do you like country? Do you like rock? Do you like classical? And I'm taking a poll. Then you can put it in a graph format. So there you're teaching the graphs, but then you're using the kids' preferred things. Does that make sense? Is that helping you to start? That's how you start thinking about those things. Okay? I showed you that already. We're going to establish routines. And routines are vital to kids. They're vital. They're vital to us. We thrive on routines. And I'm going to plan ahead about the words and concepts I'm going to use with them. And I'm going to use that hand under hand technique. And I'm also going to promote active participation, and even if it's partial. But I want them engaged. We used to have a, uh, a class that we would go out on community-based, and every Friday we would cook. And John was in a wheelchair, pretty, he had CP. We would undo his foot when it came time to put the stuff in the oven and let him kick the oven door shut. <laughs> now John was all about that. John was with us from the moment we started until we got to there because he knew his time was coming. And he wanted to kick that door shut. We found a creative way to get him engaged and involved. And sometimes it takes being real creative. But, and it may look weird and you get all kinds of looks from the other teachers. But you know what? You're going to get that anyway because we're in special ed. So I may as well capitalize on it. I'm going to have fun with kids because that's how we're going to get them to do stuff with us. Routines, uh, which is also activity-based instruction. <sighs> routines, I thrive on routines, you thrive on routines. Think about your morning routine. Anybody? What's your morning routine? Chaos. Chaos? <laughs> Coffee. Gotcha. Yep, told my granddaughter there is no cereal before coffee. Uh, well, there you go. We've got to have it. We thrive on it. What happens when your alarm doesn't set? Oh, oh holy. <laughs> Everything goes out the window, and you're all messed up the whole day. We thrive on it. Same thing needs to happen with kids. They absolutely, we don't teach them rotely. We do not teach things systematically. Things for them just happen. 
They don't see the pattern in it. If I'm very predictable with stuff, I'm going to provide that security. It's going to decrease the stress. That also gives them the ability to anticipate if I do it very much systematically. There's also a beginning, a middle, and the end. And I'm going to be very systematic on how I do that. And then it also gives them a little sense of control. So in, think of a routine or activity-based instruction as having four parts. The first is the preparation. That's we're going to blank, whatever that is. And usually if you have some kind of object or some kind of way for them to know what's going to happen, check your schedule, what are we doing, that's the initi initiation. Then I'm going to take that and I'm going to put it where he's going to, she's going to put it where we're going to do that activity. So I'm going to take it from the schedule and I'm going to take it over to where we're going to do it. Then I'm going to have them help me gather materials. Why? Because that's concept development. How are they going to know where things come from? That's part of concept development. But what happens is the magic fairy comes in and right. poof, there it is. And then the magic fairy comes in and poof, it's gone. And the kid has no idea what, what it was. It came in and then it left. And that's how it happens. They don't know where it comes from. And it's not that we're, we're horrible teachers. It's we don't think. We're in the moment and we're just trying to make it through the day. But you've got to stop and think about those things, those little things make a difference. All right, so initiation and pr preparation. Those two things. Then the next part is the core. That's the actual activity, whatever that might be. But even when I'm doing that core activity, I'm going to line it out so that they know exactly what's going to happen next and next and next. These are the steps to this whatever we're doing. Then termination, and this is the most important part. Why? Because where do we get the most behavior problems? In those transitions. So what I do is I terminate three times. I do it when we're almost finished with the core. I'm going to say, almost finished. One more, whatever it is. I'm going to let them know it's, it's going to close down here pretty soon. Then they're going to help me to gather those materials again and put them back where they belong. Now, I understand and I hear you. I, I, you don't have to say a word. I see it in your eyes going, uh-huh. Yeah, I'm going to be able to do all that. As much as possible, folks. Keep it real. But remember, they don't know where things come from. And if they don't know where things come from or the names of things, you're not going to get very far. So let them know that things have a place. They're to put it back. That's the second finish. The third finish, we're going to take that cue or whatever it was and we're going to put it over here in the calendar system or the finish box or whatever and we're going to say finish then. So that's three times. I think one of the things that happens with kids is that we don't properly close activities out. We say, oh, it's finished and we rip it out and then we're off and running on 15 other things. And that kiddo is still back on that real fun thing we did at 10 o'clock this morning and it's now two. And they're ticked off. And they got no way of telling you, you know what, I really like that, what we were doing. But you didn't close it out the right way. So they're still, their head is still there. And they're still wanting to do that, but they got no way of letting you know that. So think about that really systematically designing anything. When you do it that way, you can teach a kid anything. Anything. You can teach them those standards. But you got to do it this way. You got to put it in a systematic way that they can understand. All right, concepts are how we connect meaning to objects, events, and people. They provide that foundation for literacy. The concepts, and I'm all about some concepts. This cartoon, it's fish, 
And the little kid's reading a book and he says, hey mom, what's, what does thirsty mean? Well, what does thirsty mean to a fish? You know, and there's a lot of concepts that are like that. How do I even get to there? That's kind of weird. I don't know how to really get concept development. There are categories of concepts. There's concrete concepts, there are semi-concrete, and then there are abstract. Concrete relate to objects or things that are tangible. So it's things we can touch, smell, taste, be held. So it's concrete. We can really do it. Tangible concepts that affect deaf blindness are that objects exist, objects have permanence, objects are different, objects have names or labels, objects have characteristics, they may be hard, they may be um, square, they may be all those different things, and they have a function and use. How many times have you given kids toys and they do this to them? And you go, they don't like toys. What do I do? It's because nobody, remember, I'm going to go back to that incidental learning. We learn how to play with stuff by watching others. If they haven't been able to, this means nothing. And it becomes a bang or out of sight, out of mind. So we got to get them in there and we got to teach them actually what you do with that toy. Because they don't know. Semi-concrete relate to an action, a color, a position, something that can be demonstrated and held. So I can jump, but see it's there and it's gone. So that's semi. You can show the motions, but they don't stay where they can really touch them. Make sense? And then abstract are feelings, ideas, qualities, so love, nervousness, patriotism, honesty, all of those things. Important concepts to target, how the world works. So that routine, I'm going back to those routines, that cause and effect, purpose and use of objects. So we're actually showing them what that means. Where things come from, so that's that taking them and bringing it back or putting the things back where they belong, that kind of thing because those are the concepts that they really need. And how the natural world and the cycles, laws, those kind of things, those are the things that we need to target. Uh, how the physical environment is arranged and navigated, so there's that O and M. So it's that presence and absence of things, that object permanence, space and distance, the positional concepts, routes, landmarks, barriers, how things are sequenced, so the beginning and the end, order of activities, time concepts, and then self-concepts. So the mental perception of oneself, and we don't do that with kids. We don't think about their self-concept. If you, they haven't seen each other, if they don't have the vision, they haven't seen each other, they don't have that concept. They don't understand that I have eyes and nose and mouth just like you do. Those are the things they don't. I, have, I exist and I have feelings. I'm frustrated. I'm angry. I'm happy. I'm tired. So giving them those emotions and letting them know those things. I can do things. And I affect people and objects around me. See, they don't necessarily know that. And we don't purposefully teach them those things. And those are things that are very important. Also, social concepts. So greetings and introductions. That's why it is important for me to let them know, hey, it's Nancy, even though I've been their teacher for 10 years. They still need to know. Shelly, my student, used to do this to me all the time. I was like, yeah, you're right, it's thunder thighs, I'm still here. They're still there. How to play. Because remember, how did we learn to play? We watched others. If these kids have never seen others play or experienced that, they don't know how. So you got to get down in the floor and do show them how to play. 
when you have this ball, we can do these things with it. Make sense? And expect things, expectations in social um, situations. You know, we do say please and thank you. I don't care what. We used to, with Shelly, we would cook every week. She never ate anything. Never. But we cooked every week. Why? Because everybody else in the world does. So that when she went home and mom was in the kitchen and couldn't hold her or whatever, she could turn to her and say, no, I can't right now. We're cooking. So that she understood what that meant when mom says, I'm cooking right now. I can't do this. We take for granted those things, folks. Isn't that incidental learning? It is incidental learning. Absolutely. But we have to purposefully teach it. I also want to warn you, there's a big, big, big difference between concepts and skills. Skills are what we as special educators, we thrive on that. That's what we do. Skills, 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 skills. We don't necessarily teach the concepts behind it. So we have to stop and think about concepts. And there's a bunch of stuff about concepts. <laughs> Exposure to books and print. <laughs> And here's this kid mouthing, and it says, is that a good book? So we have to think about that. Exposure, key component of early literacy learning. We've got to expose it to them. They don't get to be 13 and never been around a book, and all of a sudden expect, we expect them to know what to do. They've got to go through those stages no matter how old they are those developmental stages and go back and look at them, they've got to have exposure and they've got to do it. Awareness of symbols and signs and print and braille, all those things. Um, home, school and community, so you need to do it everywhere. You need, they need to see or experience others. That means that if I'm writing something, I may need to get next to that kid and let them know that I'm writing so that they're aware of what that is. I have to maybe get creative if they're blind or if they have a lot of motorical problems. There we go. Uh, they need reading and writing centers, even if it's an older age group. But you need to make it age appropriate and adapt to those traditional books and variety of materials. Make it accessible and give them multiple, multiple opportunities. They're not going to learn it one week and you go, oh, doesn't work. It takes longer than that, folks. Okay, so here are a few. Here's a little girl that's got a magnifier with a light with it. Then we've got on the back of the chair, we've got labeled. Just like you would in any preschool or whatever, you've got it labeled, but it's her tactile sign. Uh, this is a cootie game but it's got the, the clock, you know, the, the switch that can move around. And the, instead of the dice, then they're going to use that switch and make it, you've never played Cootie? Oh, Cootie's fun. It's got little parts of a bug with legs and eyes and it, antenna and all that good stuff. And so then they roll the die, or in this case, they do the switch. Okay. We're going to label environments. We're going to name the symbols. We're going to use attendance cards or sign up, sign in sheets. We want a visual, tactile, sign alphabets. Use all different kinds of venues of papers, pencils, crayons, markers, stamps. Get creative with it. All right, so here's some name symbols. So everybody in the class has a symbol. Everybody. So that they know this is where their cubbies are. They have their pictures. They also have their symbols. Symbols for where they hang up their stuff. Here's attendance charts. So here are their pictures. Here's Kenny's work. And he's supposed to go around and get everybody. Who's here today? Are they all here? Let's put their stuff. Oh, wait a minute. Somebody's absent. Who is it? So who is here today? So there are different ways that you can do that. It's laminated so they can cut it, check it off at the end of the day, wipe it, and there you go again. 
Okay, exposure, here's another way of attendance charts. So it's just those creative ways. Delivery worksheet. So first they're doing this, then they're doing this, and then they're doing that. So they've got a check off of where they're going, what they're doing. These are little bins, the cubbies, the, the different places where they can have ex access to these different materials. So it may be pencils and crayons, glue, whatever, so that they have that space and they can get in there and the space is identified. That space is defined and they'll know where and how to get it. It's not just out there, okay? But I want to label it, and sometimes I want to put the tactile representation of it. Here's another. These are all books that have little bins. They're story uh, boxes. So give a mouse a cookie, and I'm going to have the different tactile representations of the book, and that's how I'm going to read the book or tell the book to them. Okay? Then here's just another. These are Braille books. Uh, but I'm going to have in my classroom... A little space over there that's the library yeah we go to the big library or you go to your librarian and say can we have just a little section so that when they come to your your library once a week there's a place that they can go and check out books like our, our storybooks okay so you're making that happen uh, book corner uh, here are board books with simple pictures. I might put textures with some of them. I may not do the whole book. I may only do four pages of the whole book in that way. But it's just a way to get them started with understanding, I need to flip this. I need to turn the page. I need to do those kind of things. Here's another board book with simple pictures and actual objects to touch and feel. So here's a duck, but I'm going to have a little yellow duck that they can hold. See, that means this. Because some kids need that. Board book with simple pictures, and I might highlight and define it in black. So I'm going to define the picture that I want them to visually look at. But I'm going to use maybe the puff paint kind of stuff or something so that they're able to identify Touch and feel book with simple pictures because I want them tactually to be able to do it. There are a lot of them that are out there. You can also do it yourself. I've done brown bear I don't know how many times. I'll well, <laughs> they've all been given away. I never keep my own. Anyway, same book with tactile embellishments. So if it's talking about a kitten and, uh, and the knitting, then I might do some yarn that's over there, I might glue that in there so that they're able to feel it. And I might put something else. Magazines. I'm going to expose them. Teenage kids. And what I'm going to use is, uh, you know, the sticky adhesive stuff so that there's not 45 pages to this magazine. I'm going to spray and, and only have maybe four pages so that you've sprayed it down, but then they're able to, this is uh, about a ski boat. And there's the, there's the person skiing. But I've done it so that there's only a few. This also makes the magazine a little sturdier than you know how paper usually is flimsy and hard to do. Uh, Here's more. I'm going to put my vocabulary words up on the bulletin board. Uh, spring words also tactually represent them so that I'm using that space as a place to explore and a place to look at. Classroom chores are also a big one and great. And you can represent those uh, line drawings, pictures, tactually, whichever way you need to depending on the kids. Uh, the back of their chairs, back of their chairs with their labels. Uh, I'm going to label everything in the room. I might use that line drawing to say this is the tissues. I want them to know that it has a name. It's not just that box that when this crap comes out of my nose, you know, they don't necessarily know. To, and my nephew used to call him a bless you. <laughs> Okay, so then there's exposure, the brailler. 
So I'm going to have some kind of tactile representation to let them know that's what this is. Um, here's objects and the symbols. So you're talking about the uh, different parts of a, of a uh, flower. So that goes back to your standards and needing to know science things. So this is how I'm going to do it. I may not have to break down all of the different parts. It might be just good enough for my kid to know that flowers have stems, they have leaves, and they have the flower. That doesn't mean I have to get into everything. Think about what's important to that kid to know. It doesn't have to be every single piece that's in that standard. Know that. You're trying to get them there. If that's where they can get, that's where you go. Uh, more bins that are just labeled. I'm going to label everything in my room that way so that then I can start saying instead of me running around and fetching and toting, I'm going to teach them where those things are and teach them how to take them back and let them do the work for me. Oh, so-and-so, it's your turn to go get the silverware for us or the whatever, utensils. That's not silver, huh? Uh, exposure to print. Here's menu choices. So if we're going out to McDonald's and I have the actual object, so let's talk about what you want at McDonald's. What are you going to get? And you, do you want chicken McNuggets or do you want a hamburger? So I can talk about those different things that you would get and label those things so that they know how to order for themselves. Ta-da! <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Let's eat.